Hello and welcome to the Digital Construction Skills Podcast. My name is Chris Grant, Partnerships Manager at Digital Construction Skills. And coming up, we are talking all about laser scanning and reality capture. The Q&A was hosted by Saffron Grant, Director of Setting Out for Construction. Saffron is also Managing Director of Digital Construction Skills and author of the book, Setting Out for Construction, A Practical Guide to Site Surveying. This event is brought to you thanks to funding from the CITB Digital Transformation Through Leaders Project. For more information, you can visit www.digitalconstructionskills.com or email me, chris at digitalconstructionskills.com. Saffron began the webinar by asking Scott McGibbon, a digital construction and construction SME specialist, what advice would he give to an SME construction business? wondering about how they can use and apply the technology. SME to sort of determine that we want to capture react, we want to capture data, but we want to capture the real-time data. So I know there's huge moves with regards to BIM and new build, but if you think about it, a lot of the construction industry is repair and maintenance, facilities management, it's actually existing buildings. So we try and bring together looking at laser scanning, looking how we can improve these types of things. And, and, and in the last little while, we've seen a, a gradual move towards companies actually becoming more and more interested. Whether that be it's because laser scanning is what I call the, the Hollywood type of tech where everybody is, sees what the end product is, whether it's a 3D model, you know, it's the old singing, old dancing type of thing. But it's really, what does that mean for an SME at, at the coalface on a day-to-day -day basis? So we actually, so we looked at laser scanning and said, where could we implement this within the workflows within construction? So it's not just about, we're not necessarily talk, talk about using laser scanning to create a 3D model. You know, we've actually done some projects and I won't, I won't go too deep into the technicalities, but... When you laser scan, you actually capture things called point cloud, point clouds. So these are just various points within space. And depending on the type of laser scanner that you want to use, that can determine the accuracy or what you want to do with it. So, for example, we've done one project. It was actually a, a repair and maintenance con contractor. We were actually uh, renovate, doing a retrofit on a series of tenement buildings down in Greenock. And they were actually, because it was a stone-built uh, building, they had, and there was lots of repairs to be done to the externals. And because it was a highly intricate architectural building, to actually capture that data is quite labour-intensive. So we, we, we managed to talk them into using laser scanning. We actually got in contact with Le uh, Leica. Leica came on board as a bit of collaboration. Uh, with the project, and they gave us an in-kind donation to actually the use of the, the laser scanner for a day, which was great, which allowed the, the contractor to actually just have a bit of play about with the machine. And these machines now are, again, I'm not, an ex I'm not the high-end expert, but these machines now are almost getting to a stage where it's almost, if you can use a mobile phone, you can use a laser scanner. That's in a simplified terms. There's a lot more that needs to be involved in stuff like that. That's why these guys that are the specialists that's on the rest of the panel, they'll give you a better insight. But the problem is, as a contractor, you have to understand what you want to gain from using some sort of digital tech, whether that be a laser scanner, whether that be a UAV, whether that be infrared thermography, whether that be various other types, whether you want to use a digital platform, whether you want to use a mobile, whether you want to use a tablet, you know, we're starting to move into these areas uh, now. And for us, laser scanning, my background is that originally I started off many years ago as a stonemason. So I know the intricacies of actually having to take, you know, templates, actually extract dimensions. It's a highly expert level and knowledge needed but the problem is that not one person takes the same reading because then it's a human issue 
Whereas we're using digital tech now, so we can actually almost increase the accuracy. Um, what we did was we done a comparison on, on one of the projects where we actually asked um, one of the contractors to, so that we could actually show a cost-benefit analysis against what their existing work processes were. We done a comparative analysis between what they do existing and against what they would do harnessing the laser scanner. And, <laughs> you know, we made a few assumptions, uh, but bottom line is that the, the, the time and the quality was we saved over 30% in time. And, th and that was between collation of data, that was between going back and forward to office, because invariably, if you've been involved in surveying for a lot of number of years, you go out to a site, you'll have your pen and piece of paper, and invariably, you think that you've captured everything, and then when you get back to the office, you find out, oh, wait a minute here, I need to go back and visit that site. Whereas using a laser scanner, we can actually capture every bit of data that we require on the external or on an internal, and then we can do the sort of planning or the logistics or the project management when we come back to the office. Um, but again, I'm missing a big chunk out between because it's we can capture the data, but the big the big chunk of work is actually processing of the data. So uh, this is when you bring in these types of guys, these these experts. So that that that's really good, Scott. I mean, that shows how it can, you know, help the finished quality, how it can help save time. Not just on, I'm sure it's not just on the um, actual usage of the equipment, and um, but on the whole, the, the project, the project life cycle, um, and also, and that was another interesting point that you made about the funding and the support that you, that company got from Leica on it. You know, I don't think SMEs, re you know, realise what actually is available. And it's not just like, here's a scanner, go and get on with it. There is a lot of support and there is, you know, innovation funding. Um, and, you know, as you said, like... You, 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 what you tend to find is a lot... Well, a lot of these guys that are, you know, the Leica, Faro, various organisations that are actually doing this, because we're on a cusp of that we're actually on a... We're on a movement towards a digital change. And... These guys know that, that to actually, you know, that, yeah, the, 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 the policy governments are actually trying to create a top-down approach. But the problem within the industry, and my belief is that it needs to be a, a top-down, bottom-up approach. We need to actually tackle the industry from both directions. And the only way that we can do that is by harnessing the expertise and the knowledge of the manufacturers, the software providers, so that what it is, is, is it's not that one person will be able to do the whole gambit of work. It's a collaborative process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not yeah. very good at collaboration in construction. Oh, well, we will be soon. That, I mean, if that's one thing that COVID's done, hopefully it's going to um, bring on a lot more of that kind of thing. That's brilliant. Thanks very much, Scott. No problem. Brilliant, thanks. So, so Philippos, um, Philippos Diathakis is the Director of Scotia Survey and Safety. Um, reality capture and surveying equipment expert. So, Philippos, you work with companies of all different sizes on a whole range of things. So, Scott's told us a bit about what the technology can be used for and what the benefits are, but what, what, what about companies who can see the benefits, but they're not sure what to start, where to start? You know, is this something they can easily outsource? And if they do decide to get an outside company in to do a specific job, you know, how do they know what, what to ask for? And how do they make sure they get someone competent and end up with the right deliverables? Hello, uh, everybody. Um, Scott has very nicely put it there. The, the key question to ask is, what is it that you're looking for? What is the deliverable that you're after? Because mass data capture using laser scanning, using drones, using... Um, technology that will capture loads and loads of information is going to uh, prepare so many different deliverables that uh, you can show the same data set to about 10 different people and they can find different uses uh, as uh, from uh, utilities to surveying to inspection to marketing to archaeology to manufacturing, construction, pretty much every single sector can benefit from it. And this is 
something about more than a decade ago when I got my hands on a, a GLS 1000, Andy will let you know later on, it's a top gun, one of the first laser scanners. You needed two people to lift that on a, a, a tripod. But as Scott said, the technology is now is getting much easier, much smaller, much better to use. And you see that, you see that every day. And you see that also on the deliverables because not only they are, you capture a lot of information, but now more people can use them. So the software that comes in the back of that becomes a lot more easier to use. People can use it on mobile phones again, can use it on any laptop, any web-based browser. It's getting there in a way that allows everyone to understand it more, which getting into your question, it's practically finding companies. Thankfully, there are quite a lot of companies at the moment that are carrying out um, the survey work and uh, can offer these services to literally anyone. There is, I, I haven't found a single industry that you'll show them the benefits of laser scanning, the benefits of um, uh, mass data capture, and they cannot find a way that they can use it. I personally started back in Greece using it with archaeology and capturing heritage monuments and that became just a little uh, spark to just get me starting to get more people introduced with this technology because not only it provides a plethora of deliverables that anyone can use um, but also the way that you capture now the information is faster way faster if you compare it. there's no other way safer because you can do it remotely without any problems more accurate because you capture anything even things that you wouldn't even think to scan as scott said there that there is times that you come back from a survey and you realize oh i didn't do that phil i didn't do that but if you laser scan you captured the entire 360 dome around you and that takes you to the fourth benefit, which is more economical. Because in the long term, if you dis identify how much more information you got and how much it costs you, it is always, there hasn't been a single scenario where it hasn't been more cost efficient to do it. And as Chris Bess will say, Great Mark is doing a great, a great job on delivering this service to their customers. And uh, there is quite a lot of companies there that can easily um, assist their customers. Anyone here in Scotland can ask uh, Scotia, for example, for any uh, issues, any questions on how they can benefit from that. And yes, we can offer that support. But more importantly, uh, going to the second part of your question there, Training is available and it is now in a stage where on a half day course, full day course, a weekly course, you can get anything from using the kit, using the combining it with other means of technology like um, robotic toll stations or GNSS receivers or even utility detection equipment, then you can combine and truly prepare a 3D document of the real world. And at the end of the day, you can get trained on using the kit and most importantly, get trained on using the software. This is something that the laser scanning process on occasion may even look boring because you press a button and the scanner will do its thing and you have to wait two, three minutes to finish. But the processing side of things is where you can just benefit from everything that has been captured. All the information is still there. You can get it polarized. You can get every single point that you and I would see from that scanner's position has now become a 3D coordinate with all its information there. And honestly, anyone can use it. 
So thanks for that, Phil. So you mentioned we've talked about what you know how to get the right deliverables, and obviously that comes from um, you know knowing what you want to achieve from the survey. But what can you just give us an example of what um, deliverables might be in that context? Of course, the, one of the easiest uh, to understand is if you want if you're working in surveying and you want uh, the elevation of a building where you want exactly to identify locations of windows, doors, roof, gutters, everything. This is one of the easiest deliveries you can, you, where you can prepare from a single, maybe two scans, an ortho, ortho corrected image of that elevation, and that is ready. Then you can have volume calculations on much, much, much higher um, resolution, you can use a long range scanner uh, against the face of a quarry and you will get everything, every bit of volume from that surface. In construction, you can get continuous um, quality control on the manufacturing of a building of um, a huge um, applications in uh, dimension control, in uh, any sort of steel building, any sort of uh, uh, structure that requires uh, continuous monitoring where you can just scan it and then compare it with the design and straight away you will have the key deliverable from all these is what it's called a point cloud, which is millions of points, but they're all usable information that can be used in many, many sectors. A lot, lot, lot more applications, sorry, but yeah, I can literally go on for hours going through <laughs> different results. No, that was brilliant. That was some, some really good construction context examples there, Phil. So no, that's, that's brilliant. Thanks very much, Phil. So, Thank you. Right. So Matt Hull then is a digital integration specialist for Leica Geosystems. So you're obviously involved in some high profile projects, Matt. So could you tell us a bit about what happens with the data captured and how does it work with different softwares? Yeah, so um, whenever we uh, go out and capture our data, we then need to bring it back into the office and uh, start doing our kind of registration process. So this is essentially where we start to take all of this data and make sure that it all aligns correctly. We can also start to remove any kind of unwanted data uh, as well out of that. What we're also able to do with some of our Leica technology is actually use the likes of our Field 360 application, which allows you to actually on site visually kind of QA, QC your, your scan data and make sure that you've not actually missed anything and then start to actually register all that together on site before you actually go back to the office. So some of the things you can get from, from that data um, at this kind of registration side of, end of things is you're able to get uh, reports out of this to show kind of how your survey data has come out, tell you the quality of it, um, and then also uh, extract out the likes of, uh, for example, ortho images if you want to start doing uh, your elevations uh, and things like that, that as well. And um, some of the deliverables from that data, um, you can use them in a lot of kind of downstream applications um, to allow you to work on that. And it can be used in a variety of different softwares. A um, couple of file types that people might know are the likes of a recap file, um, which is an Autodesk technology deliverable, and can be very simply taken out of that and then used to be brought into to your design software. If you look at something like uh, our own file format, we have a, a like a Geosystems file format. Um, which is an optimized point cloud that will allow you to actually use that in all of our kind of downstream softwares. It's also important to point out that you can also combine all of this information. Um, so you could be using your HDS scanners or you're using your um, terrestrial laser scanners or even UAVs or drones or even photogrammetric information can all be brought together and brought into that one kind of deliverable that you can then take out. Software-wise, um, it can be used uh, in a lot of different softwares natively. Um, so it depends whether you want to go into like a 2D environment or into the likes of a BIM authoring software. Um, but you can start to get some of that information in without actually having to use any additional 
uh, software or technology. Some of the stuff that we, for example, have as like is, uh, for example, our Cloudworks application, which is a very popular application uh, for people wanting to consume this data inside their softwares. If you take, for example, AutoCAD, for example, um, we have a plugin that allows you to bring that three-dimensional data into the AutoCAD environment where you can then start to use all those kind of familiar kind of AutoCAD type commands and that interface to actually then start to utilize your, your data. You're able to create very accurate kind of 2D, 3D as built. Um, you can also check against kind of existing conditions, perform critical construction fabrication, kind of QA, QC, and a lot more. And you can do that all directly within some of the applications, like for example, AutoCAD. If you were going into a kind of uh, a BIM workflow, so building information modeling workflow, um, then uh, if we were using, for example, Revit, we're able to bring this point cloud data in and then accurately start to use that. If, uh, for example, if we're using Cloudworks again, um, you're able to bring that in and you can start to extract out pieces of information from that 3D data. If you're wanting to extract out a piece of steelwork, or even some pipes or walls, floors, structural members, doors and windows, and even mechanical equipment, you can start to extract that out and then get that information into your design software ready to be used. It can also be used in a lot of other um, different types of software. Um, there's softwares there that you can use for performing uh, detailed analysis on your point cloud and also against your your kind of design model or your BIM model. Um, for example, verification of construction works. So uh, we're able to create accurate reporting of what we've completed in our construction phases and actually report that out using this software, or sorry, using the point cloud data or rally capture data uh, inside different bits of software. And um, we can also do some examples of this can be simply as just uh, checking prefabrication panels that you've made in the factory being able to go out and capture the data of that process and then compare it in a piece of software to tell you whether or not you're inside or, or outside of your tolerance. And then also for doing like volumetric uh, and material takeoff lists, you can do all that with, with that data as well. That, that's brilliant. So, so like Phil said as well, is basically like almost an infinite amount of different ways you can use the data and you know, hundreds of different applications. Um, so, so how does it cross, how does the data then, how does it cross boundaries between the design and the construction phases then? And even the end, even the actual, the whole life cycle? Yeah, so this data can be, kind of bridges the gap between design and construction by basically enabling people to kind of share and visualize the construction site. So being able to capture all this, this large scale data, bring it back into the office where maybe you have somebody who's, who you don't want to be out on site. You want to be able to get them, get them some engagement with, with that project and kind of let them see how that works. But it also allows for kind of better and more informed decision making at kind of various stages of construction. Being able to extract out your kind of as built information as your project's going along. Um, and being able to get it more accurate and more readable as well from that kind of reality capture data. You're also able to kind of gain this kind of in-depth understanding of the building at each kind of construction stage. So being able to share this data and being able to make it accessible for other people to go in and view it uh, is an important part of that kind of bridging that. And um, if you're going back to the like example of Jetstream Viewer, um, we have uh, an application that allows you to view that point cloud data and visualize it and share it instantly with, with other people in either the design team or even the client or the facilities management team. And they're also able to then start to integrate those design models to allow you to kind of visualize that design either on site or even in the office or if you're facilities management. And you can do that kind of pre, during and post construction as well. That's fantastic. So, so what's the relationship between the data capture then and BIM, which has come up a couple of times in, in, in conversation? Yeah, so this data can all be used within, uh, within kind of your BIM workflows. So if you're trying to utilize this within your, your BIM workflows, you're looking at kind of using it 
for that kind of better planning and design side of things, being able to bring that in and again, just making those informed decisions and looking at how you bring the site back into the office for those kind of the architectural technologists or the the BIM guys that are sitting in the office. Um, it also allows them to use, for example, uh, scan to BIM, which a lot of people might have heard of. Um, but being able to bring that information into your kind of your BIM environment, understand the existing site conditions, being able to measure off that data very accurately, um, and then also being able to, for example, add asset information into that point cloud data so that you can then pass it on to the facilities management back ending. And then also just doing all that kind of analysis throughout the construction phase. Um, if you're using some of those verification softwares where you can actually see um, what stage you're at in construction is very useful for whenever you're in that kind of BIM workflow, trying to figure out what's going to happen at what stage or what phase. Well, that's brilliant. Thanks very much for that, Matt. I don't know how you managed to um, get so much information into that, <laughs> into that last five or ten minutes, but my, my head feels full already, so I don't know what it's going to be like after we've spoken to the next three people, <laughs> but that's brilliant. Thanks very much. So, uh, James Bex, then, is the UK Digital Survey Manager for, for MWH Treatment. And so MWH worked with lots of tier one contractors and designers on various partnerships, delivering major framework works on behalf of, of a lot of the largest water authorities in the country. So James, could you take us through what a tier one designer and contractor might do with the survey information? Yeah, definitely. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. We are, um, like Saffron said, we are one of the leading consultant contractors in the UK water industry. So we work across six of the major frameworks in the UK, for everything from Scotch water down to the south coast and southern water. Um, we work independently as ourselves. We also work in a number of sort of joint ventures. Um, so the water industry is challenged every five years in what they call the AMP cycle um, or six years in Scotland um, where we have to drive efficiencies, um, reduce costs and everything because effectively it's all those people on the call and the wider community that, that pay for what we do through our water bills and everything. So certainly as MWH we have a, a digital delivery sort of process. Uh, that's how we deliver our projects and how we have done for sort of certainly five years, but as we've entered this latest AMP period of AMP 7, uh, south of the border at least, then that, that is what we have to do. Um, so within that digital delivery process, we have what we call a digital delivery toolbox, uh, of which digital survey and laser scanning, that type of thing is is part of that. And getting that 3D reality capture is sort of fundamental to the foundations of our work. Um, we need accurate survey data effectively which we get from primarily terrestrial laser scanning but we do a bit of UAV stuff we do a bit of photogrammetry and um, we do various different things but primarily it's terrestrial laser scanning um, you know and off what are looking for us to to get a 33% lower cost and be 50% faster so if we don't if we are you know if we don't do this type of thing moving forward we're gonna we're gonna really struggle um you know, like I say, it's the, it's the building blocks of what we do. Um, and I think the we have many benefits that we derive from it, but I think the key one from my point of view in my role is the fact that it, it gives us that ability to collaborate and gives us that effective communication, whether that's part of the design at the start of the project or whether that's through the construction or whether that is engagement with our clients, engagement with wider stakeholders. It might even be people in the general public, you know, sometimes we are working on the greenfield site, so we're building a whole water treatment plant from scratch. Other times we are doing construction or upgrades to existing plants and the technology works in both those arenas, which is really good, you know, like a couple of the other guys have said, when you have that we call it line of sight technology, effectively. So you, you can see everything that that you've taken in that in that sort of scan, um, rather than historically where you've gone and you've done the 
traditional topo survey, something like that, and you haven't got that that level of detail, level of data you need, and you have to go back. You know, um, we we bring our point clouds and what we deliver from our point clouds, you know, whether that's a Revit model or whether that's um, uh, what we call visual project initiation, where we, we do um, engagement with the general public and things like that. You know, we, we use aug uh, augmented reality, we use virtual reality that we can drive our point clouds through and into. Um, and obviously, in these in these current times, what we're in in COVID at the moment, you know, the teams that I manage have been uh, busier than anything in the last sort of twelve months to get out there and get get that visualization element to our projects. Uh, I would say we probably do some form of reality capture on eighty percent of our projects. Certainly, in some of the regions, we're probably closer to a hundred percent. And I think it's. It's something that we find that probably is of interest to the guys on or guys and girls on this call is that it was a challenge when we first started doing it to get people to use these technologies on smaller jobs. It's all right on a on an eighty million pound scheme spending a hundred thousand pound on survey because it, it you know it's it's worth it. It gives you the benefits, but trying to trying to give that cost benefit analysis and to show people that if you've only got a a fifty thousand pound scheme, still having that that little bit of survey, which is more expensive than a traditional survey would be, gives you those extra benefits and how you how you manage those benefits and what, what you derive from those benefits. Um, classic examples I would say for us is that the benefits in health and safety we get from from doing these type of technologies is really good. You know, we we can we can work at high, we can we can work in confined spaces and we can stop having to put multiple people into those areas of risk and, and reduce the risk from the, from these jobs. We've done many um, scans inside confined space and then people who aren't confined space qualified can enter these areas and have a look and understand what's going on and help them with the design, really. Um, we do a lot of what we call DFMA, so off-site fabrication, effectively. Um, and a lot of the time we do quality assurance on that. So before we then ship it to site, we'll go and scan it in a factory to make sure that what we've built on site in the sort of civil concrete tank world, the mechanical electrical equipment will fit into that space before we go on site and, and have to lose time through that through that type of thing. That, that's, that's brilliant. Thanks, James. So... What would you say are the main roadblocks and barriers preventing this technology being used more widely then? And how do you think we can overcome that resistance? Um, I think really, really from my point of view, there's, there's, there's two main roadblocks, and, and, or not roadblocks, but there's two main challenges to, to embedding it in the business, in the, in the industry. And they're, they're quite separate. They have very different um, needs and requirements to solve, shall we say. I think the first one is... Um, get, getting people to understand, like I said, that it, it does give you benefits and you can derive those benefits, whether that's health and safety, quality, cost, efficiency, collaboration, whatever the benefit is, getting people to understand that having this type of survey and getting this data does give them that and how they can realise those benefits, I think, is the most difficult thing, you know, not to cast aspersions on people, but certainly in the sort of design phase, the engineering phase, as we call it, it's well used and it's well understood. In the construction phase, delivery phase, it's maybe a little less well loved because the guys are the guys are used to working off a two D plan drawing or a section, and they know how to take the measurements and it's got everything they need. Um, so that there, there's a little bit more reticence in in adopting the technologies but i think one thing i would say is if, if we can convince those people to use the technologies once they have used it they don't want to go back i know um matt mentioned recap it's something that we use quite a lot in terms of sharing our outputs to give that visualization element to people um and once people can see it and they're, they're almost in the in the real space and they understand how how assets interact with each other and, and the, you know, they're not just looking at that one piece of equipment that they're actually working on or as part of their commission, they see, they see the whole wider, wider state, wider um, 
position of the asset and a wider sphere of influence. I think they tend to understand it. Um, and I think the other major thing that, that um, is probably my biggest headache at the moment is just physically the size of the data that we have from from laser scanning. You know, we because we work in the water industry and we work on large sites a lot of the time, some of our um, outputs can be multiples of gigabytes. You know, we can be talking 30, 40, 50, over 100 gigabytes sometimes. And storage is difficult, but certainly in the current situation with people working from home, sharing and utilising those those can be really difficult with people having, you know, um, private broadband speed, shall we say. You know, they haven't got the the fast landlines that they have in the in the offices and things like that. So I think that's the real real challenge at the moment. I mean, there's things that we can do to to alleviate that. Uh, I know that Phil was talking about making people or trying to get an understanding of what people actually want from their from the output. And I think that's key for us because a lot of times we may get sent to to scan a whole site when we're only working on a little piece of the site and it's it's understanding what, what we call the the sort of density of that data. Um, so we, we may do a higher density point cloud in an area where we're concentrating on and lower density sort of background visualization in other areas. You know, we can we can do it in black and white rather than in colour and reduce reduce that way, or we can only um utilize the data in certain areas. So we may only convert a little bit of the data, but always have that um original data set to, to refer back to. I think that I think that's that's something that um drives efficiency and is, is going to help people understand the data better. That, that's really interesting, the point you said about, um, you know, the storage of data and that, um, you know, being a potential barrier. And I think, we'll, we'll, you know, that's an, another webinar in itself, the technology that's available and that, that side of things. So um, that's brilliant. Thanks very much indeed. Brilliant. So we'll move on to um, Andy Gibbons. Senior Ge Geosystems Engineer for Top Compositioning. So, and we know that Topcon are continually pushing the boundaries of new innovations. So, could you tell us a bit about how the technology actually works, Andy, and how it's evolved over the last few years? Good afternoon. I'll certainly try to get all that into five minutes. Um, so, the easiest way to uh, think of a laser scanner or describe how a, a laser scanner works is to think of it as a toll station. Um, or an EDM, and hopefully most people are familiar with a, a total station. You turn your horizontal and vertical angles um, and it measures a single discrete point. A laser scatter is, is doing exactly that, but faster. Um, and you, laser scanners will collect data from a couple of hundred thousand points a second up to a couple of million. Uh, Sent a beam of light, hits the surface, um, you get your return signal. And it's measuring um, your angles, uh, your slope distance. You're getting additional information, such as intensity or the quality of the return signal. Um, most scanners now have also got um, digital cameras on them. So not only are you getting all the raw measurement information, you've also got the visual picture or, or the image uh, to colorize that data as well. Um, as uh, Phil mentioned earlier some of the, the very first scanners and scanning technology has probably been around for almost 20 years, if not a bit longer. Um, you know, the, there was a small coffin um, to carry the original scanners and you needed another case equally um, as big for the batteries. So the, the big change in all this time has been the physical size. Of the, the instruments have shrunk considerably. Um, and it's the same for any electronic uh, technology, you know, microwaves, TVs, everything like that all uh, comes down in size as the technology improves. Scanners have also had a number of other um, sensors added to them over the years. So uh, the first scanners were, were uh, raw data measurements only with no cameras. So the first uh, advancements, if you like, were, were adding that digital imagery. Uh, we've got GNSS technology in some scanners now, um, IMU technology, the National Measurement Units inside. 
um, and the, the size of them has come down um, significantly over the last couple of years um, and the speed as well so going from um, scanners not so long ago there were some instruments on the market were uh, scanning it in a range of 20 hertz 20 times a second now you're getting two three million points a second but it, it, it's already been mentioned that has its own problems in itself is you've got all this data um, three million points a second plus the high definition imagery what do you do with it how do you manage it but different topic um, and in terms of um, the technology that's uh, reducing in size itself, it, it's not only benefited um, terrestrial laser scanner, but it's exactly the same technology that's used on uh, UAVs. As the scanner technology itself has, has come down, the sensor size is reduced. You can put that same technology onto a smaller UAV, um, you know, sub five kilograms now, I think will carry a laser scanner as opposed to the, the 20 kilogram UAV systems. You're looking at mobile mapping systems. So the um, the one that springs to mind straight away is always the Google car, the, the vehicle they use to capture street view. It's exactly the same scanning technology in mobile vehicles. Um, and then I suppose really in, in more recent times, the big advancement, which um, has the potential to, to really change things and, and beef things up in, in terms of laser scanning is the the introduction from Apple of the laser scanner on the smartphone. Now the accuracy may not be there on the on the iPhone at the minute. I watched a, a webinar on Friday, I think it was last week, and they did a comparison between uh, terrestrial laser scanners and, and the data from the iPhone. And you were looking at five six inches. Now, you know, it can't be used for um, surveying or um, any kind of high accurate work. But the technology is there now. You can get it down into your phone. It, it's just mind-boggling where it's going to go um, in the future. Is it going to go into safety glasses? You're going to be walking around construction sites, not physically holding anything, but the sensor is going to be in in a pair of glasses. And this is just pure speculation from my part. I've got no proof to to, uh, to show that's definitely where the industry is going. But with sensors that small. You know that the potential is huge for it. So I mean, I know some people just want to get the scanner and get on with using it, and then they might not be interested. But for people who are interested, you know, how can they find out a bit more about about the technology and how it works? So there's plenty of um, training courses available. Um, yeah, Top can offer training courses. We'll go into as much detail as end users would like. Um, I'm sure the manufacturers will offer the same. Um, Philippos will run a training course uh, as well. So really, um, when it comes to finding out how the technology is used and, and how individuals want to get into it to find out how it's used and how it can benefit them. Um, and it's been mentioned uh, several times before, it's understanding what they want out of the systems. Um, sitting down and thinking, talking to people and um, actually putting down what they want out of a training course before they sign up to the training course. So they get the, the best out of it or the most out of it. And the, the trainer doesn't go off on a tangent and deliver one route of training when the answer might be down a different route. Yeah, so it's about getting the right training, basically. I'm sure there's probably like e-learning and online, you know, there's probably lots online about Thank it you. too. Plenty of online um, resources, yeah. Um, and so, can you give us some examples then of how you know the tech, top con are using the technology on on major construction projects these days in a, a cutting edge way? It's really, the big one that springs to mind at the moment is is the whole um, digital twin uh, concept, where it's not just using the terrestrial uh, laser scanner as an individual tool, but it, it's combining all of the tools in the, the position and portfolio. You're using terrestrial laser scanners, you're using mobile mapping, um, UAVs, you've gone back to, to total stations, um, GNSS receivers, uh, and bringing all of the data into a central model, um, central database, uh, really. 
And I think one of the things to just generally understand about all of this technology, and it's still a question we get asked on a regular basis, is oh, I want to buy one instrument. Which instrument will do everything for me? Um, short answer is there isn't one. Every piece of equipment I've mentioned will do its own job. And to get the best out of the whole product basket, it would be a very expensive investment, but you need um, a piece of each kit and you bring all of the, the data, all of the sensors together to complement each other. You know, so terrestrial laser scanners, are, for example, are, well, all of the technology is line of sight, whether it be DDMs, GNSS, um, laser scanners, photogrammetry, in one way or another, it's all line of sight. If the sensor can't see it, you're not going to capture it. So you have to bring it, uh, bring it all together. Um, from the ground, you've got terrestrial laser scanners from above the UAV. So is that kind of used um, on, you know, is it earthworks projects or buildings projects? What, you know, what does it, what does that technology do? What's it, how is it helping on these these major projects? So I think traditionally and. and Primarily, probably still, it's still um, vertical construction to so buildings, um, specifically uh, internals. Um, but I think more and more it's been used on construction sites for, for volume calculations. Um, your long linear roads, your motorway upgrades, your, your HS2, I'm sure, will be using it. Um, for, for infill, specifically in your, your long linear projects, um, UAVs are becoming more and more popular. A lot of them are going to be at the moment, photogrammetry based. As the, the sensors come down in size, you're going to get more and more LiDAR scanner based uh, UAV systems. But then the, the terrestrial scanner still got its place as this infill where the UAV can't see the data. So it's, it's like really in any um, position technology, um, they can be used anywhere. Brilliant. So, so basically, it sounds like. Where they're not being used, the soon will be anyway. So <laughs> they are. They said that the, the, um, the implementation of Apple and the, the sensor on the iPhone is just open to scan and walking up to, to every man and his dog now. Yeah, um, yeah. We're just going to get the problems of now I've done this scan and it's not accurate. Which scanner did you use? My iPhone. Yeah. Why pay <laughs> 20, 30 grand for a terrestrial laser scanner or a, a UAV when? I've got it on my iPhone. Why isn't my iPhone accurate enough? But it'll come. Undoubtedly, it will come. Oh, brilliant. Thanks very much, Andy. Thanks for that. So, um, Chris Best is a survey technician with Gridmark Survey. So, Chris, you're, you do, you're a site engineer. You do a lot of site engineering tasks. And you've recently started using a laser scanner. So we really wanted to get someone on this webinar who is who is an end user and who is using it in construction context. So so tell us then how have you found that and what other have you setting out and surveying or what or your other skills and competencies have you drawn on in order to be able to, to get up and running with your laser scanner? Right. Hi everybody. Um, we've been using our combination of bed terrestrial laser scanner along with UAVs um, to complement our traditional um, topographical surveys and volumetric um, calculations for um, examples, uh, quarry, um, cut and fill exercise for new build sites, as in we can get topographical information for a site pre-construction pre uh, pre uh, right the way through to um, top spot, top spot removal to and cut and fill comparisons for built-in models. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges we've had was to try and get clients to help us to understand what level of output they actually need from us, because I think that's one of the big parts of actually being able to provide the right data, utilise the right tools to give a client the right end result. Um, we've had projects where we've needed to use combine um, UAV um, survey data with terrestrial laser scans alongside uh, traditional total station surveys uh, and blend all of that data together into one um, specific deliverable. Um, and I think one of the challenges were, was to actually understand how to um, geo-reference all of that data so it produced an accurate model for, um, for an end client. 
Uh, but from a construction perspective, it is as much from um, getting original OGL survey information. Uh, we've done um, building elevations. So um, an example we have one going in Hexham at the moment, there's a historic um, facade that needs to be kept with a brand new steel construction um, building going in behind it. So that was scanned actually to prove the, the verticality of the, of the facade. Um, so they can actually design and build their steel work based around with the existing building structure. So that's great. So can you tell us a bit about like what you can now do differently and what possibilities does does having and using that laser scanner open up for you? I think one of the big things that just allows to go back to is um, when a client comes back with change requirement or an additional requirement, we've got a chance to go back to that extended data set and actually extract the information without a site visit. Um, you've also got the health and safety aspect of not necessarily having to work close up in a more dangerous environment. Um, uh, for example, um, we do some volumetric work in, in a quarry base because we give it a combination of a UAV survey from above as well as a terrestrial laser scan from a safe location within a quarry, quarry uh, to get quarry um, face data without actually having to get it in the way of machinery that's actually on site. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's one of the really good benefits of actually being able to gather data and you quite often find you have a client who changes their requirement or has an additional requirement and having that data electronically to go back to is a real benefit without having to look at the cost of going back to site. So do, you, so do you think the return on investment of the kit itself is, um, you know, is, is demonstrable? Oh, 100%, 100%. In a, from a health and safety perspective, from um, a cost of site or site revisits, you've got that aspect alone, but also the additional data that can be provided that a client potentially didn't even know they wanted to ask for because you can then demonstrate um, additional data that was gathered uh, and we're getting additional requests for information, for measurements, for something that I haven't even occurred to the client that we've had to deliver. So, so what advice would you give to anyone who's looking to get started with laser scanning then? Where, where, did, where would they start? Um, well, we use um, Trimble Gear exclusively. Um, we had a really good partnership with our suppliers, Corec, um, who really helped us out um, with some lower end evaluation equipment. So we could actually get a chance to try the equipment out prior to purchase. Um, one thing I specifically found with um, terrestrial laser scanning was you, the approach you need to take with it is almost completely different. You've almost got to take a, a photographic or video um, aspect to look at what you're actually trying to um, gather data from. Because if you don't have your scanner set up in such a way that you can actually, I think as in, uh, Andy was saying earlier, if, you, if, the, if the scanner can't see what it's looking for, if you, you can't actually measure it. So you're almost looking at um, gathering data. Um, you need to think about it in a 3D perspective. So for um, some scans, when I first, when we first started, I was doing maybe one or two scans, and we were finding out the data set wasn't as complete, complete as, it, as it could have been. So we spent more time actually stepping back and thinking, actually, A, what does the client want? B, what is the actual subject physically require me to look at and see. So we're actually ended up doing more and more scans, not necessarily in high density, but um, from a greater number of angles to actually cover, make sure we have all of the actual visuals covered. Yeah, that's brilliant. So it's just good to have that that perspective from, 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 from the site engineer or the, you know, the construction phase yeah. point of view. And actually, um, you know, we've got a kind of great range of perspectives here. We've got trainers, suppliers, users, um, you know, contractors. So, <clears throat> so that's actually been really, really brilliant. Now, I have not yet mastered the art of looking at the chat and concentrating on what people are saying. So um, thanks for that, Chris. And I'll, I'll, I'll speak to the other Chris now, Chris Grant, and say, is there any, any final questions, Chris? Yeah, there, there was a, a question from Alex. What are the industry's views on smaller laser scanning technology? Does the industry only trust the bigger and more established tech providers? 
maybe we'll, we'll go for an independent view of that. Maybe Scott or Philippos may want to take that one. All I was going to say is that um, I've seen there that um, Alex mentions uh, like Afaro and Matterport, but uh, definitely, um, as mentioned earlier, Topcon has released some really interesting uh, instruments, not only just laser scanners, for example, but also a combination of toll station laser scanner. Then there is smaller handhelds like uh, Geoslam, where they have other functionalities which can help. Um, even uh, other, there's massive companies that are not big in the UK, like uh, Regal, for example, where um, they do offer a, a different approach. But there is so many companies out there that will offer a solution, and um, it's it's just going back to the first question is uh, on finding exactly what the customer needs, because you may have a nice, expensive, uh, long-range laser scanner, but when you're trying to do, like James does quite a lot of water project, water, uh, water treatment plant, then you need some sort of handheld scanner to see behind the pumps or information that is not otherwise, and always one major source of mass data is photogrammetry. It started with that back in the 70s, and photogrammetry is still a major, major method of capturing information. That can be captured, again, using a digital SLR camera is the best way, but as Andy mentioned earlier, the technology is getting smaller and phones can also be used at this stage with the proper control and the proper use. So there's quite a lot of methods and quite a lot of um, manufacturers that can be used. Maybe a brief answer for each of these then. Um, this is the one that we just began. Well, what is the one thing that our panellists think would help create a tipping point for the widespread adoption of laser scanning in the construction industry? Start with you, Scott. All right. Uh, I think I kind of sort of mentioned it slightly to begin with, is that for democratisation across the industry, we need demonstration projects. We need, you know, our industry is huge on what's it going to cost me, how much time is it going to save, and what's the quality I get, and what is my outlay for that? And I think what we need, is, especially for the SME market, is actually a having demonstration projects with actual return on investment, cost-benefit analysis, these types of ideas, so that, you know, people automatically can pick up and say, right, I'm thinking about diving into the area of digital tech or laser scanning. I want to find out, first of all, what I could possibly save, you know, you know, so, some objective data. At present, what's happening, you know, I, I mean... You know what construction is like from a contracting perspective. It's you know nobody wants to share their what what their their pricing structures are, what their their competition because they're under severe severe pressure from tender restrictions or you know trying to keep the business continue, trying to be resilient, trying to create a bit of growth. You know, so I think I think that's what, from my perspective. Uh, you know that it is. It's it's like everything. You walk into you walk into Curry's or PC World, and you go to choose the TV. You've already got your understanding of what type of TV you're going to choose because you know how much one is going to cost, what the what the outlay is, and what the product that you're getting from it. And I think that's what it is. Is there's still that sort of little bit of mystery surrounding the sort of the reality capture tech, even photogrammetry. You know, uh, I know. Uh, Phil mentioned the photogrammetry. Even that's still got a bit of mysticism around it as such yet, you know. Matt, would you, do you want to, what, what about from your perspective? Uh, I think the, the biggest thing is is just educating the, the kind of construction industry to what you can actually achieve with this technology. I think if, if more people had a better understanding of what they could potentially use it for, or the benefits that they would get using that technology, I think that would go a long way in kind of uh, 
showing how that technology can be utilized on site and, and how it can be bring benefits. And um, especially now when we're trying to limit the amount of people that are on site and um, being able to demonstrate how you can bring that information back into the office without having to have too many people on site. I think if that kind of education side of it could be put across, I think that would be a big factor in, in kind of the adoption of this kind of technology within the, within the industry. Thanks for that, Matt. James, you get your hand up there. Yeah, I was just going to really say, from 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 our point of view, obviously we are we are on major projects and we 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 own some scanning equipment. But I think for SMEs, the the, the big thing is don't don't be scared of it. You know, there's there's plenty of companies. I know people have mentioned Corec. You know, there's plenty of other companies. Sunbelt Surveys, Gap, lo loads of companies will hire this kit. You know, so don't don't be scared of it. If if you've got a project and you think this might work have a go these guys will help you out you know they'll, they'll they'll let you take a piece of kit they'll give you a bit of training you can have a go with it and see if it works for you see if it fits your type of project don't just think oh i'm never going to be able to do it because i can't afford a fifty thousand pound outlay on a on a bit of kit and software well well made point and did you want to maybe follow up as maybe you're like one of the suppliers it might be a good good to hear from you from your end yeah, just reiterate what the, the two previous um, speakers have said there, two panellists, um, training and education. That There's too many um, small companies that maybe uh, go to a higher shop to hire it, try it once, mess it up, and, and get put off the technology altogether. Um, let's just educate people on how to use it. Take the black box mystique away from laser scanning, uh, prove that it is easy to use, and the data... Uh, the different workflows are easy to follow. There's nothing complicated about it. And thanks, Andy. Fair, that's a fair point. Uh, Chris, Chris Best, do you want to make a wee contribution there? Or would you think you're the, you're the end user just now? What's your recent experience been in terms of maybe the interface with uh, the suppliers and, and all, all the rest of it? Um, I think the big thing for us is actually understanding the client requirements and actually fitting the right technology to fit and actually getting a client to see and understand the actual extensive deliverables you can give them um, opens their eyes to what the possibilities are. And if there is a potential um, cost difference um, or time-saving difference that you can actually provide them with, I think that's one of, the, one of the key things is just finding the right project for the right client and deliver them with that wide data set and all of a sudden they become educated on what laser scanning can actually deliver. And at that point, you kind of get them on board and it kind of drives the interest going that way. That's that's one of the places that we're, where we found things. Brilliant, Chris. Now, Phil, just do you want to do a quick answer just to finish off? And then I think that Saffron, we've we'll kind of went over a wee bit of time, but there was just so much to cover there, guys, and we could have probably spent a lot, a lot longer on this, but um, it was a good start. But Phil, do you want to say a few words just before we go? All I can say is that, uh, as I said, started about, 14 years ago using the technology and I find it every day that if you manage to get in front of people to show them what the technology can do and how easily can they can be trained or provide the full deliverable there so they understand what the benefits from it are, then I don't see why it's taking so and honestly I, it's already taking way longer than I expected but I, I, I like it that when companies understand the benefits they keep using and keep using the technology. So it's just a matter of getting it in front of people and teaching them on how to do it. Well, guys, I just want to say thank you very much to Scott, Phil, Matt, Chris, James, and Andy, and for Saffron for presenting. That's just been a brilliant, another brilliant session. And I'm just so thrilled that you've all decided to come and, and, and share your insights with us. I think we're getting a really broad perspective of, of laser scanning, and hopefully we'll have these on again soon. Um, to talk more about this subject because I, th I think we're just starting to scratch the surface of it.